Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast, Advanced Conversion Strategies for Mobile Search, Secrets to More Clicks, Calls, and Sales. My name is Michael Bryan. I'm a reporter with ClickZ and I'll be the moderator for today. This webcast is sponsored by Dialogue Tech. Please note that we will be recording today's webcast and we'll create an on-demand version that will be available soon after the conclusion of the webcast. We will be doing Q&A at the end of this webcast, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. This can be done by clicking on the Ask a Question button. Our speakers today are Blair Symes, Director of Content Marketing at Dialogue Tech, Diane Pease, the Inbound Marketing Manager at Cisco, and Eric Warner, the Search Marketing Manager of Home Depot. Uh, speaking first is Diane. So, Diane, we're ready when you are. So let's talk a little about the, about the customer buying process. It has changed a lot in the last few years. Um, everything is becoming more in the empowerment of the buyer. Where, in, For example, these statistics show that 60% of the customer's journey is now done digitally. Before, you had people going out there soliciting um, business or soliciting clients, and now people are actually doing all of their research online. And, um, again, 90% of customers um, are going to initiate the first step in the cycle, not having a salesperson talk to them. This has really caused a big evolution in how people are selling their products and how people are buying their products. Next slide, please. So marketing, we always talk about B2B and we talk about B2C, but it's really more along the lines of B2Me because People are now empowered, as I was saying earlier. They get their information from social interactions. They get reviews. They can get information from their friends. They're going to do search queries on the Internet. They're going to do a lot of research to look for these products. And it's really important, especially with paid search, that we encompass that and take that into consideration when we're putting our marketing um, plans in place. Next slide, please. And so the customer journey has also changed as well. This is an actual example of a customer buying journey that we currently use at Cisco that shows all of the different touch points during the process. And search is a very important aspect of that, not only in the beginning of the customer journey, but actual touch points throughout the cycle. In making sure that your brand and your messaging are not only consistent during this process, but you're also reaching out to people during the different stages of the buying journey. Next slide, please. And really, it's all about being there. Um, it's being in the right place at the right time. It's being on. Whether customers may be searching during the workday, they could be searching in the evenings, they can be searching on the weekends, they could be sitting in front of their TV with their laptops or their phones. They're multitasking. They're always going to be looking for something. And this is um, being where people are always going to be, not only just with paid, but also with the organic as well and social media. So having your brand and having your message there at all times and all places, it's all about being there. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little bit um, about paid search, and we're going to talk also a little about SEO, but I want to talk specifically about some mobile best practices that are very important to keep in place. Um, as most people, and I'm sure most of you are aware of mobile getting that took place um, a few, actually a few weeks ago now, um, this was a very um, critical update that Google put out there where they're identifying, you know, ranking signals based on if your fact is mobile friendly or not, and there were a lot of websites that did lose um, search traffic from mobile as a result to this. Are there more algorithm changes to come? There's a lot of indicators out there that say that this is only going to be the beginning. So it's very, very important to make sure that your, um, your site is mobile friendly and be and prepared for that. Another good practice is making sure you minimize your page load time on your on your on your site for mobile. Make sure your code is very streamlined, very efficient, um, and reducing the number of redirects, which can definitely slow down the load time. And we know on a mobile device, load time is a very critical um, factor. You want to make sure that your your pages are rendering quickly. 
always make sure you optimize your titles and URLs and your meta description for mobile. And also, it's very important to optimize for local search. We'll be talking more about that with, um, with some of the other um, presenters during this session. And also include your city, city and state in your metadata as well. That's very important to do. Next slide, please. So what are some new things that are um, going on in mobile SEO that's new? Um, actually, as of last week, um, it was reported that Google is starting to test larger images in mobile search results. So if you're out on a mobile device, they're actually going to be pulling images into your search results. Now, this is sh what we're seeing so far is it's kind of showing on the left side of the ad when you're on your mobile device. Now, it could slow down the, the results page loading time, but again, this is something new that it looks like Google is testing. So it's something we'll definitely keep an eye on. Google has also um, in, in, uh, provided an autocomplete attribute in Chrome. So for folks on a mobile device that we, we know how we love our autofill on Chrome, I know I use it all the time, it's going to be great to have this on mobile as well because in, in a lot of cases, and especially I know with Cisco with um, demand gen, which is what I work with, you know, sometimes we do need to have people fill out forms to get email information to, you know, again, be able to contact those people at a future point. So by having this autocomplete attribute in Chrome, it's going to be really easy, a lot easier for people to do forms on a mobile device. And that has been a, a challenge, you know, when one of the, I think, drawbacks for a lot of people going with mobile because, oh, how do I fill out a form? Well, this is going to make that process a lot easier for them. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about mobile landing pages. It's very important to think mobily, um, and it's different behavior on a mobile device than on the desktop. And I think that's what is a big challenge out there for a lot of people because they um, realize that you can't. It's it, it's um, a different. Um, way of communicating. It's a different way of um, speaking to people because people are, are very much um, on the go. They're, they're not necessarily sitting somewhere. They might be walking. Um, and they, they need to be getting a quick and instant message. So it's very important um, to think about designing your page specifically for that experience, realizing that people are, are going to be with shorter attention span, and making sure that you provide a version of your page on mobile that is a positive user experience, and making sure that, you know, if they, if they come to your site and they realize, you know, they're not going to have that positive experience, they're going to probably, you know, vanish. They're not going to come back. And, you know, it's always important to be able to capture people having that right messaging and making sure that that experience is going to be um, a positive one. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit more about the actual pages and the design of these pages. The headlines on your landing pages should be very short, less than four words is ideal, and should consider using pages that are image driven. People are very responsive to images and videos, so making a page that has a lot of um, images is going to be easier for someone to respond to. Um, make sure that all your call to actions can be performed on that one page. If you're a product um, business, you want to make sure your product information is very visible. Your page is easy to navigate, and not and you don't want to be scrolling up and down a lot. So as much as you can capture in that one screen as possible is ideal. It's always about a strong call to action, especially with mobile. You want to make sure that it's something that someone can you know take that message and do take an action with it right away. If you do have form fills, it's ideal to keep them fairly short. Again, on mobile, you're thinking someone's using their thumb, so and, and not always easy to, to type things in, so make sure that you have those as short as you can. And think about the time to purchase. You don't want someone spending a lot of time on a page on their phone trying to fill things out or do things. You want to make it as an easy and streamlined process as possible. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about ad copy. On mobile devices, ad copy is a very different. For one thing, the real estate on a mobile device is a lot smaller than on a desktop. You only are going to get maybe the most, maybe two ad positions. So it's very important to make sure that, again, you have short and street description lines, but it's also important to incorporate extensions. The reason being is when Google 
put, displays your ad on a mobile device, if your extensions are performing well, it might actually show your extensions and it said, instead of your second description line. So in that case, you want to make sure that you have extensions in place that if in case Google does decide to sub, sub, switch those out, that they'll be displayed out there. Um, but ideally, you always want to make sure that you have that um, second um, text ad line in place as well. Again, think of your extensions as kind of an additional arsenal, an additional way that you can have your ads display. You want to keep your description lines very short if possible. Um, also, using the mobile preferred option in AdWords to make sure that your ads do display and, you know, properly on a mobile device. Again, always keep in mind what performs best is what's going to be served. Um, next slide, please. So the big question is, well, what do I do for a mobile site? Is it mobile friendly? Is it mobile optimized? Is it responsive? What's the difference? And a lot of people get these very confused. And we're going to talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail and talk about some of the particulars of it, and then talk about, you know, what, what's the best one that you should use for your business. Next slide, please. So mobile friendly is pretty much the standard that's out there right now. Again, this is what with mobile getting coming out, this is what Google um, uses is to, to check to make sure that basically that your site displays accurate between a desktop and a mobile or tablet. It's going to appear smaller on a phone, but it's still functional. And really, uh, most developers consider this the best practice for all website developments, and it's probably the easiest one for, for companies to do. If you're wanting to get out there on mobile, want to do something that's not going to be too terribly difficult and time-consuming, this is probably the best way to go. Next slide, please. The next step is mobile optimize. So this is a little bit more advanced than mobile friendly. Your site is automatically going to reformat itself to a mobile device. So again, your navigation buttons are going to be friendly to the thumb, obviously, because that's the way we typically navigate on our mobiles. Your content is going to be reformatted to display correctly. Your images are optimized to mobile, and you're going to have the larger size touch points. As you can see in the picture, between the three devices, you can see that everything adjusts according to the size of the screen. So this does allow users to engage more with your site and can allow for a faster purchasing decision. So something to keep in mind, again, this is a little bit more advanced, but it's probably overall a better user experience. Next slide, please. So responsive design, there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> information out there about responsive. Should I use responsive or should I not? Again, this is kind of the, the upper echelon step where you're basically um, developing a site that's flexible independent of the type of device. Um, it automatically adjusts itself um, based on the screen size. It, um, Google has indicated that it also prefers sites that are more responsive, but this is not the easiest option. And for some small business, it's not going to be the best option because it does require um, a development effort on someone's side to, to, to create this. And it's also a change in a design mindset from a developer's standpoint because you're using the content you already have as a foundation, and you have to design with what you currently have as opposed to building something from scratch. And that can be a little bit more of a challenge. Again, you're having to think mobily when you have to use responsive design. So a lot of larger companies have, have gone with this, again, but if having the resources and the you know, technology in-house sometimes can be a little bit of a challenge. Next slide, please. So mobile retargeting, this is something that we're um, actually currently working on with Cisco right now. I'm very excited about this project. Um, we're really looking forward to doing some testing with it. We're really um, doing a lot with retargeting right now. And what better way to encapsulate people is with mobile as well. So again, with me targeting, as we know, once someone comes to your site, they're basically cookied, and then you can go back and serve them an ad, for example, on the Google Display Network to retarget them, bring them back, at possibly you know, proposing a different promotion, like a discount or something like that. Um, so on mobile, it, it's, it's ideal to work the same way. Again, you're assisting buyers on the journey, and by sending them a remarketing ad, um, you can promote something on the mobile, you know, again, it's improving your possible conversion rate because we know retargeting does tend to improve conversion rates. But again, using the mobile technology to be able to do this. 
Yes, so we're in the process of getting this um, started right now and really excited on looking at the opportunities of how this is going to perform for us. Next slide, please. So with mobile, um, phone calls are what I call the new black, if many of you um, watch the show that I kind of stole that line from. Um, What's with mobile technology increasing, phone calls are now becoming a very critical conversion point um, because it's so much easier for someone to be out. They want to do something, but maybe they want to talk to somebody on the phone. They want to make that phone call. There's a lot of value to that. Um, so we're making sure, especially here with Cisco, that we're in, you know, looking at not just mobile the um, ads and things like that, but also incorporating some of the new technologies that are coming along around phone calls. Uh, next slide, please. And this is where call-only ads come in. Um, this is something that's been out just a few months. Um, we are currently working with it at Cisco, and um, I know some other clients that are working with it as well. Um, what's really neat about this, this is truly a true mobile-only campaign in AdWords. And what it allows you to do is you can actually have a call button on your phone. The call no, your phone number is explained at the top of the ad. Um, and a click is basically a phone call. So, you know, people can immediately take an action. And it allows you to create some very targeted ads around this because you've basically got the call to action tied in with the call. But you can do some really creative things with your ad text. For example, saying something like, you know, agent is available to speak to you right away. Um, contact us for daily offer, it promotes um, an action. And it's, it's been very successful for us so far because we a lot of times we'll take people to a call center to screen them, to pass them on to our sales reps. And we found this has been a very effective technique. Uh, next slide, please. So we actually did a case study with this um, to talk a little bit more about it. And um, we implemented it in early February, which is about the time that call-only ads came out. We saw our click-through rate was well over 5%. And typically um, with our um, normal um, AdWords campaigns, they hover right around 3 um, Our cost per click was relatively low, about $1.25. Um, we did have a little bit of challenges with the ad copy and messaging, but I think we're still working on that to try to make that a, a little bit better. But, you know, again, it was a good learning. We wanted to test it because it was a new technology out there, and I always am one of those people that if something's new, looks like it might be something to test, especially when it goes around um, mobile. I'm always a, a, a fan of trying to test things out. Um, so we're actually working on setting up a new testing account for mobile for us. We're basically going to use it kind of as a test bed for all of our testing with mobile. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see because we're going to keep it as a separate budget. Um, it's going to be separate from our other accounts. And hopefully it'll give us some, some good insights that will you know, definitely be you know, separated right away from everything. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little about call only ads best practices. Um, the call to action, again, is not about the call because you've pretty much already got the call to action built in. It's always important to use that second description line to emphasize that someone is really there on the other end. Um, someone that can take their call, that you have an agent standing by, speak with a representative right now, speak with a representative right now, um, and to create the ads to allow the both the clicks the calls and clicks to your website. Um, it's again adding those call extensions in there as well is critical. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. I think now it, we're going to turn it over to Eric to to talk about his section. Well, thank you, Diane. That was that was really great. And um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is how fast mobile search is growing and some of the implications of that. I was able to uh, reach out to some of my friends at SEO Clarity who had just completed a big study where they they looked at 500 of the largest websites in the U.S. And they saw this trend of how fast mobile is growing. And um, one of the things that this implies, I think, is that 
mobile search traffic grows so fast that even um, there are many companies that will actually create a mobile site, and even though that mobile site might lack some of the important features, and it might have quality issues, and it might not be optimized for search, they'll still actually see their traffic continue to rise. And uh, it gives a good opportunity to rest on your laurels if you're not aware of just how fast this is moving. So I think this is especially important in light of the mobile Geddon update because there are all these companies that have been rushing to get this done in time by this, by this date that Google set for us. And then as a result, there's going to be a lot that, you know, they, they may not have been able to incorporate all the features that they would have liked to if they had not been, uh, not been kind of given a deadline. So mobile conversion rate, um, as we can see from this, this chart, has not changed a lot in the course of the last couple of years. I mean, one thing that we do see is that uh, it follows, generally follows a couple of, uh, you know, has, has some seasonal trends. So you're able to see that, you know, kind of in the November, December range, uh, it spikes pretty good both across desktop and mobile. Uh, you can also notice that in, in the latter, in the 2014 bump, it was the mobile was quite a lot higher. But in general, uh, the baseline hasn't changed very much. Now, one thing I'd want to point out about this is that you can't filter out the non-buyers. And as the years have passed, we've introduced a lot of non-buyers uh, with mobile phones. You know, so you know, think think like the uh, you know people who are very young or people who have prioritized buying a mobile device, and they may not even have a computer, and they might not typically make e-commerce purchases. But there's something that uh, I wanted to point out about this, you know, that, that there's a push to have these conversion-focused features, you know. So, for example, expedited mobile checkout, you know, despite the fact that this is obviously so successful, expedited mobile checkout is only supported by about 20% of retailers right now. Another feature that is kind of lagging a little bit is cart continuity, where you're able to um, maintain your cart whether you're on your mobile device or whether you're on your laptop. As these things grow, I think it will become more important. But despite the fact that there have been relatively flat uh, mobile conversion rate, the mobile revenue and the mobile transactions are growing really rapidly. So it looks like now that it's about $32 billion in mobile commerce for 2014. And now that's not as much as desktop with $237 billion, but it's actually going at twice the rate, according to the recent study by Comscore. So then mobile is going so fast that even though the, num even though the conversion rate kind of remains flat, the number of conversions and the transactions is really remarkably uh, growing remarkably. Now, when mobile search happens, there's usually another larger screen available in the room. So people are searching on their, searching on their phones when they have a laptop nearby that they can actually complete the transaction with. And actually, Google's mobile playbook said that that's 68% of mobile searches happen at home and when there's a larger screen available. Then there's also there's a transition in both ways. So 65% that start on a smartphone 61% of those will continue on to desktop, and then vice versa. So from the people who start on desktop, about 19% will continue on their smartphone. So you have to think in the context of serving them across all these different screens. So this transition that's available, it, it kind of represents a few opportunities. Um, one transition is people decide to go to a phone call from their, you know, when they're searching on the phone in the web, they decide to make a phone call. Another opportunity is to continue it on desktop, as I mentioned. But another transition that's important to think about is the ability to reach them in your retargeting, as Diane mentioned, and reach them across those other channels. So we can fill up the funnel, the top of the funnel with, with search and then start to capture them as they move through the buying cycle. But finally, and one of the most important transactions is actually leading a user to your store. Now the challenge with that is accurate attribution. So 
you really want to get the right data. Google's saying right now that there's about four times more conversions when people are using their mobile to get to a store in terms of paid search. Another thing that's kind of an implication of this is that we have to start thinking in the context of always-on marketing programs instead of calendar or event-based marketing programs. I, you know, I kind of think that the calendar and event-based programs, they're kind of similar to a, you know, to, to kind of an interruption-based marketing or the, uh, you know, the push marketing. We wanted, wanted to, for a long time, we've wanted to push people to these certain holidays or to these certain events. And now what we're realizing is that by having an always-on mindset and being there when they, being there where the customer is and when the customer needs you is becoming more valuable. So now this ability to reconnect is, is really crucial. So you have the chance to really get into their filter bubble. I mean, one thought is that Google doesn't really show us the web as it is, but Google and the other search engines with personalization, they really show us what they think we'll be interested in in the web. And now as, as time goes on, as we start to develop more and more abilities in retargeting, that's just going to be magnified. But the thing that's going to be important to remember is the impression that you make on people when you do re-engage. One thing that's going to be a challenge is getting this into the bigger picture and getting this into the strategy because it's always easy to look at things like conversion rate and say, how are we going to cash in on this? How are we going to get that one number to go up higher? And the reality is that we have to think about the entire customer journey. And the problem that arises is that there's incentive cause biases that keep people cashing in um, because all the incentives are usually kind of in the wrong place. Um, people are, getting, are going to get a bigger bonus if they're able to increase the conversion rate. Uh, the consultants that you're working with are going to uh, get a bigger paycheck or continue to, be con you know, continue to be employed by you if they're able to show you in the bottom line and in the final analysis, look, you know, for this quarter, we made more money. And that can be dangerous in, in contrast with thinking about the long term and thinking about the needs of the customer. So I wanted to mention, you know, obviously a lot of mobile searches are going to have local intent. So local SEO becomes very important. And uh, Diane mentioned a couple of the factors for local SEO that are important to remember. Um, well, one that came up, you know, that I've found interesting is uh, Google using Google Maps on your site. So you have a choice between a few different map providers, and Google Maps is the most expensive, but it also results in a sense of continuity for the user. So you don't have kind of the shock of the user going from, you, user that's typically used to Google, um, going to your site and having a different type of map with different types of functionality and features that they might not be as familiar with. Uh, another thing that I've had a lot of experience with is this uh, need to have a consistent name, address, and phone number. So the name, address, and phone number needs to be consistent across your site, but also consistent for all of your locations on your site, but also across all the directories and all the data aggregators and all the sites like Yellow Pages and uh, uh, local focus sites. So the search engines really look at that, and that really becomes a big factor. If they see that continuity, then you have a good opportunity to rank. And if they don't, then you are going to be really challenged in that area. Another point that a lot of sites are missing in local SEO is having the pages and the taxonomy that match what people are searching for. So in some cases, people will search for the name of the city plus your product or service. But in other cases, they might be mentioned, you know, just searching for the state or the region or uh, a certain section of the state, like, you know, northeast Louisiana in contrast with one of the cities that would be there. Uh, finally, uh, I, and I see this as a big, big gap, really, is that local-focused content marketing has a big impact on your local rankings. So this is something that's left out a lot. I mean... Uh, you know, the truth is that links really do matter to local search. 
Uh, one thing that I've seen also is that links to desktop versions of your pages uh, result in pretty consistent ranking improvements across your mobile pages. You know, as long as you're using uh, canonical or rel alternate, um, or if you're using responsive or, or dynamic serving. So another point I wanted to make about the landscape shifting is the, well, relatively recently we found out that uh, the new, you know, Apple's going to introduce Adblock when, uh, with, with iOS 9. Now, Adblock is going to have an impact in a couple of ways. I mean, one thing to think about is that organic search is going to now be able to take the real first position. Uh, and, and in mobile, the first position is a lot more important than it is in desktop. You know, so there's, I think that there's you know, nearly 10% more traffic uh, versus desktop uh, goes to that first position in mobile. So that you know, becomes more relevant. But the other thing that becomes relevant is being able to do content marketing um, with a mobile focus and with a local focus. So being able to create those experiences in content that are going to cause the types of sharing and cause the types of signals the search engines are going to use is going to be more important. Finally, um, I want to point out also that now that more app content is being indexed, uh, there, there are studies being done that are showing that mobile apps are actually converting better than uh, your mobile site might be or mobile apps that you already have installed, uh, you're more likely to convert if that's, what you, uh, if that's what you find in search than the mobile site. Another thing that's really relevant to that, I think, is that in iOS 9, Apple is going to have a search API that will allow you to be able to search your phone for the content that's in your apps. So that gives you two opportunities, you know, two big opportunities in search to find a mobile app, and it gives you as a, as a, um, you know, as a, as a publisher, two new opportunities to, for, for your content to be found. Now, one thing that's really crucial is to make the right impression with your app. So people are generally averse to brand apps until they start showing value and. I think that one of the, you know, one great example of the way that uh, a company is showing that value is Walmart. Uh, Walmart's introducing a saving catcher as part of their app where you actually scan your receipt and then based on what you bought and the prices you pay, they go and they search all the different ads from different retailers and make sure that you're actually, uh, that you actually pay the least for that, uh, for those products that you bought. And then they actually apply it as a store credit if, if, you, uh, if there was any instance of you paying more. So I think that that's the type of thing uh, that's going to get people to not only download. I, I think that the, the challenge isn't downloading the app, but I think it's, it's the challenge is keeping your app from being deleted so that it has the opportunity to show up in search. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Blair. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Eric. And thanks, Diane. That was uh, some great material. So I wanted to take a minute to uh, begin by talking about some recent stats, trends, and really technologies that are impacting mobile search. To set the stage, just look at some recent data around why mobile search is so important. Uh, first of all, 50% of all searches, according to Google, are now on mobile devices. And that number continues to grow. Uh, in 2013, that number was 25%. So we've seen a, a huge increase in mobile search compared to desktop search. Uh, clicks from organic search uh, are 42%, and from Google paid search, 40%. So the, the clicks and uh, visits to the site are beginning to catch up to the overall search volumes. And you can see marketers are taking notice, and the spend on uh, – mobile paid search in the U.S. is starting to really grow. It's, a, it's supposed to hit 50% this year, and in the next couple of years, expect it to hit around 72% of all paid search will be targeted uh, mobile devices. So we've hit on local, uh, local search already, but so the stats show that you know, 40 to 50% of all mobile search has some kind of local intent. And I think the stats on the, the bottom are, are really interesting, that there's recent data that shows that 
near me searches, searches with the term near me in them, have increased over 100% in the last year alone. And 80% of those near me searches occur on mobile devices. And you can see in a, a couple of slides some of the, the new ad formats that Google has rolled out to help uh, search marketers take advantage of this. Uh, Diane mentioned the importance of, of calls and how calls are the new black, but the, the stats really do reflect this. Uh, mobile search alone in the U.S. last year generated 38 billion calls from mobile search. And that number is expected to almost double by 2018 to 73 billion. It's really a staggering number. So uh, when you're talking about mobile search and conversions, you've got to keep calls, uh, keep calls in mind. For local search, if you look at the, uh, the stats on the bottom, you can see up to 53% of local searchers uh, call a business, and they prefer uh, three-to-one local phone numbers. So if you're, using, if you're doing local campaigns, be sure to use a phone number that's local to that area and not an 800 number because you'll see your conversion rates rise. Uh, the stats at the top really drill home how important local search uh, is in terms of purchasing intent. It shows that, you know, 65% of people who perform a local search uh, went on and completed a purchase, whatever that means for that business, within a day. So people who are doing this are have high purchasing intent, and a lot of those purchases are occurring offline, either through store visits or through a phone call. So... Call extensions, of course, are a huge part of, of mobile search. Uh, I hope that every, anyone who is doing mobile search is at least testing out call extensions. But there are stats that show why they're so important. Google put out a statistic that shows that 70% of searchers have used uh, call extensions to call a business. Uh, there are some statistics that show that 60% of all calls from mobile paid search come directly from the search engine listing, from uh, from the call extension or the call only ad, and even if people click onto your site from uh, if you have a call extension in your ad, it shows that uh, click through rates are eight percent higher. So people who see that call button, even if they don't call you from the ad, they're still likely to to click on that ad as opposed to if you don't have it. So here are some of the formats that Google has rolled out to take advantage of of calls. Uh, Diane already talked about call-only ads. I'll only add that what's, what's really great about call-only ads is because calls are the only activity someone can perform from this ad, you can really optimize your bidding strategies based on what you think the value of a call is. So if your sales team or your client sales team, if you're an agency, is able to put some metrics around what they think each call is worth to them in terms of sales conversions and you know revenue generated, you can really use that data to optimize your bidding strategies for call-only ads. Uh, the format on the left, the nearby business ads, is a recent format Google rolled out where if someone searches for a phrase that includes near me or nearby, these ad formats will show up and they automatically include uh, extensions for directions and extensions for calls. So Google is well aware of the importance of, of local search and the mobile tie-in and how you know, calls are often the end result of those, of those searches. I just want to touch on two new technologies briefly. Uh, the jury's still out on these, but you know, there's, uh, voice search is beginning to become a more prominent uh, technology that marketers should be aware of. I know that younger audiences like teenagers use voice search every day. Uh, adults are still perhaps a little leery to, to jump into it, but it is the number of voice searches are growing. And uh, you need to be aware of this because, you know, sometimes the component of, of what someone searches for is more conversational in a, in a voice search. So you need to, uh, you know, target the keywords that you think are more conversational uh, to make sure your ads pop up. Uh, you can cons Google posts a list of common voice commands uh, that you can consult to make sure that you know you're optimizing for for those commands, and you can also build SEO content if you want to have your organic ranking show up for these searches around you know more common questions that people ask about your business, more FAQ type uh, content that can help rank and show up when someone searches a more conversational search. Uh, the Apple Watch, obviously, the jury is definitely still out on that, but there's no keyboard, so people will any search that happens on an Apple Watch will be through voice. Most, almost 100% of them will be around a, a local search. But, you know, it's, if, 
it's around uh, the idea that people will be conversational and, and say, you know, commands like, tell me which shoe store near me are carrying men's boots uh, that are still open right now. And that search, if the, uh, the watch will often hand off that, that search to, to the phone that's connected to it. But these are the types of technologies that are going to start impacting uh, search down the line. So back to calls, uh, we talked about how call volumes are rising, but that's great news for, for search marketers. Your job is to drive quality conversions to either your customers or your clients, and you know calls are, are definitely the most valuable conversion uh, short of an actual sale on your mobile site that you can, that you can generate. Uh, 66% of sales managers consider calls the most valuable type of lead, and there's data that shows that calls will convert 10 times or more often to a sale than someone who fills out a, a web form on your, on your site. So because of the value and the, the, the rise in volumes of calls, you really can't optimize mobile search without understanding uh, how those searches are driving calls to your business, to your client's business. Let me show you a quick example. So here's paid search without call analytics. So a prospect runs a search on his smartphone, uh, visits your site, and then uh, ends up triggering a call uh, to your business after clicking on your paid search ad. That call, you won't be able, if you're not tracking that call back uh, to the, the keywords and the ads that, that generated the site visit and the call, you won't be able to under, even tie that call into your, your paid search uh, conversion ROI analysis. You also really have no idea where the call went. So if your business has multiple locations, you won't know where that call went. You won't know what happened on the call. You won't be able to tie that call back uh, to, to your search analytics in order to optimize performance. You also can't use any of that data in some of the other third-party applications that you rely on for search, like Google AdWords or Adobe Analytics or uh, Google Analytics or any of the bid management platforms uh, that you might use to optimize paid search. So you have no, that call basically is, it, it happened, but you don't, you can't get credit for it and you can't optimize based on whether or not it was a quality call and what actually generated that call from your search. So call analytics software is one way to help uh, pin these uh, calls back to your search or to any uh, marketing channel you do. It works for social media. It works for display ads. It also works for offline content like TV or, or print or whatever it is that you're doing. So if you look at that same scenario with call analytics uh, attached to it, now you know exactly who this person is who, who's calling. You know that they visited, you know they, they ran a specific keyword search, they clicked on your ad, they visited your site, you know exactly which pages they visited uh, before they called. You know where that call went and you know what happened on that call. So you can tell if it was a quality call or not. You can pass that data down into your various analytics platforms and optimization platforms you use to improve search, and you can optimize your campaigns based on uh, that call. So it, it really works for every search engine ad and listing, and what that means is that it's not just Google, it's Bing, it's Yahoo, it's any search, but it also means that if someone calls directly from the ad from a call extension, uh, you can track that call back uh, to the keyword search that generated it, or if someone clicks onto your, your site first and navigates around and calls, uh, even if you have a store locator like you see in this example on the right, no matter what dealer or store location they called, you'll be able to tie that caller and that call back uh, to the attribution data from search. You'll also understand where that caller is calling from. Uh, if you're trying to optimize for local search, you'll know uh, the location of that caller. You know the device and the operating system that the person ran the search from that triggered uh, the call. So really what that gives you is closed-loop ROI data. So when you're optimizing your campaigns, uh, for paid search or trying to improve SEO, now you know what really drove each caller to your site. You can not only tie it to the search engine, uh, the keyword search, ad, and landing page. You can, uh, you know, tie the, the caller and get credit for every conversion and sale from search. You're not just getting credit for the online conversions. You're getting credit for the valuable offline conversions in mobile. You can optimize for what's working and really eliminate the spend on what's not. So, 
that call data is, is great for A-B testing. I hope that if you're doing mobile search campaigns, uh, you're A-B testing your ads and your, your content. Uh, this example here just shows that, you know, someone who just changed the buttons on their site from the left to the right version was able to generate 130% more clicks on that bottom button. Uh, and those are valuable phone calls that, that translate into revenue. So be sure when you do uh, your A-B test to include call analytics and call conversion data to really understand what's working uh, to optimize on the, the best possible version. And, of course, I touched on this already, passing all that call data into the various platforms that you rely on, whether it's uh, a web analytics or your CRM system like Salesforce, or bid management tools, make sure that you're able to use call data because that's really what mobile search is all about. And here's an advanced strategy that most people don't often consider. You know, you're generating these calls. Marketers can actually control what happens on the call. So to set the stage, we all know that not every call that, gener that your marketing generates the quality call. A lot of people are just uh, calling for directions to your business or to look about account information or basic business questions. They might, it might be a, a mistaken call or a solicitor. You don't want to pass those calls on to sales, and you don't want to consider that a quality call when you optimize uh, your, your search marketing. So what, one thing you can do is pass that call to an IVR first, which is an automated voice menu, which can be as simple or as elaborate as you want, but it can basically uh, have that qualify that caller first to make sure they're make sure why they're calling and if they're a sales call to help route them uh, to the right place. And I'm going to show you an example in a second of that. But the routing component is interesting uh, for search and for mobile. You don't have to send the call to the same place. You can automatically set up rules that route calls based on that caller's exact location. So you can triangulate on that caller using cell phone technology that can tell exactly where they are located, where they're making the call from, and you can route the call to the closest store or dealership or whatever your business model is to uh, automatically to get that caller to the best possible place. You can also route calls differently based on the keyword search. Uh, if someone's searching for careers for your business, you don't want to send that caller to a sales rep when you can send it over to your HR department, for example, or time of day if your company is not open or if you have certain business hours, you can route calls differently uh, to different locations or different places based on all of these things. So it's something to think about when you put your search campaigns together is that when you're triggering calls from, from all these new formats and call extensions, you don't have to send them to the right place. You can actually put rules in that route calls optimally uh, based on certain factors and all the analytics you're capturing about the caller. So uh, lastly, understanding what happens on the call is also very important. There are several ways that search marketers who aren't obviously taking the calls, you're generating these calls for your sales team or your stores or your clients, uh, your, your clients if you're an agency. You can't listen to every call. You probably won't listen to any call. But you can generate reports on call duration, for example, how long each call uh, lasted or do an average of calls from certain campaigns, how long they're lasting, that's usually an indication of a quality call. You can also record the calls. So if you want to go back in and listen to a specific call and conversation, you can go ahead and do that. You can integrate that data with the CRM system to track that call from your search through the sales funnel, hopefully to revenue or to an opportunity. So you can generate reports not just on uh, cost per lead, but then cost per opportunity and cost per account one based on uh, search. And lastly, one quick technology that's starting to catch on is around actually running, capturing the conversation and actually allowing marketers to run searches through the text that was actually spoken on a conversation to pinpoint calls where certain key phrases that you think are important were mentioned. So, for example, if someone wants to buy now or they're asking about a discount or a demo, you can run searches through every call from your search marketing and filter those based on certain criteria and then see exactly which calls these words were spoken. And it can give you great intelligence into which calls converted to a sale, which were quality calls, and really how people are actually speaking so you can optimize your search campaigns for those keywords that people are actually using in their conversations. So to finish, I wanted to give a quick example that ties all this in. 
Uh, Dialog Tech, my company, has technology that does call analytics and automation, some of the things that, that I covered already. And I wanted to show you one quick example that ties in a bunch of these components together. And this example is with an agency called Square One, who was hired to do a, basically a national campaign with local intent for one of the world's largest heating and cooling manufacturers who've got a bunch of dealerships in the United States. They wanted Square One to run paid search campaigns to help drive uh, you know, calls and drive, uh, you know, enrollment, uh, drive opportunities for those dealerships. So Square One uh, used Dialog Text call technology with Kenshu, a bid management platform. So whenever somebody called, uh, called in from paid search, Dialog Tech captured all that inter attribution data and passed it on uh, into Kenshu, which was able to optimize automatically for which keywords are actually generating calls and web leads and stop spend on ones that didn't. So you can understand the true value of each of the keywords you're bidding on and optimize automatically across search engines for what's driving content. And then it, uh, Square One also passed that call analytics data into Google Analytics so they can see side-by-side -side data that captures both online activity, online conversions, and the phone conversion components so you can understand what's working and what's not. And when calls were coming in from these paid search campaigns, they put a simple IVR up that asked callers to press one to speak to their local dealer. It was a way for them to show that they have purchasing intent. It was a sales call. And then once they hit that press one, Dialog Tech automatically routed those calls to the closest dealer to where that searcher was located to begin that conversation. So at the end of the day, the ROI metrics were pretty compelling. They were able to generate uh, calls to 50 raise calls to 50 local dealers by 75% and actually cut costs, the paid search costs for their client by 65%. And the client was so happy that they were rolling out to this program to 50 additional dealers. So thanks, everybody, uh, for attending. I know that we're running short on time, and we might have a few chance to take a few questions. But if you're interested in getting a demo of Dialog Tech's call analytics platform, please give us a call or visit our website. And with that, I'll hand it back off to our moderator. All right. We've got a few questions. We've got a few minutes left to ask a few questions. I'm going to start with Eric. Eric, what kind of content marketing uh, can support local SEO? Well, yeah, there are, uh, there are a few things that you can do. I mean, uh, kind of the first thing, y you have to be able to find out who the influencers are in a local area, and once you find out what who who they are, and um, you know what what kind of audience they have, what one of the things that you can do is kind of have like a VIP local blogger workshop. You know, anything where you can get these people together uh, and kind of create the buzz and create you create a situation where people can talk about and and share their experience with your product or service. Uh, another thing that's really attractive is local surveys where. Um, you might be able to provide on a local basis, you know, some insight about how your geography is a little bit different from somebody else's, whether it relates to uh, house prices or the cost to rent an apartment or, you know, what kind of products people choose in that particular space. You know, and another thing that uh, works pretty well is, uh, you know, I, you know, really the EDU sites you, and actually usually private colleges are often very good targets for, uh, local content marketing, and uh, just having the ability to provide something that's really useful to their audience is something that can uh, kind of open up that relationship. Cool. So we haven't heard from Dan in a while because she was the first one to go. So Dan, I'm going to ask you, what are some, because you talked a bit about the landing pages and your slides, what are like some of the key differences between B2C and B2B landing pages? Well, that's a good question. Um, with B2B, um, I know in particular with Cisco, because that's pretty much what um, our, our focus is on, it's really focused on making sure that we're giving somebody an, an opportunity to take a call to action. It's usually kind of the first step in the nurturing journey. With B2C, a lot of times it's going to be more 
going in and 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 taking and and taking an opportunity or you know going ahead and making a purchase a lot of times with b2b especially with with the pages that we're working on now i mean it's usually sort of they're more up or funnel at, at that point they're kind of wanting to get more information you know obviously you're not going to download a white paper on a on a phone but you might want to contact somebody to get some more information about a certain product or a certain service that we might offer so kind of the the big factor that I see there is really with B2B that that landing page is going to be more about I need some more information before I can make that, you know, go down that buying journey. And then with, B2, with B2C, it is I want to make a purchase right now. So since the main takeaway from that is that it comes down to call of action, I'm going to move to Blair and ask, so you spoke about analytics. What are some of the analytics marketers should focus on once call has been made once people have gotten from the landing page and they're actually reaching out to you? Well, I think one of the, the main things you should look at is the actual outcome of the call. So did it, did it do beyond just generating a lead or a call, did it actually do what you wanted to do in terms of, I mean, it depends on your business model. Perhaps you're looking for someone to book a reservation or make an appointment or, you know, just engage with your sales team or even make a purchase, whatever it is, you should be able to tie back the outcome of the call back to the, the keyword search that started the whole thing in order to really understand the value of each keyword. Beyond that, I'd also look at things like the caller location. So time of day and caller location are great things to know so that you can understand uh, you know, where people, so you can optimize, for example, paid search based on those locations and times of day that are driving the most calls. Maybe if those are valuable calls, you can raise your bids for those, for those particular things. Lastly, I would say, you know, look at things like uh, the, the duration of the call, for example. If you're generating uh, tons of calls for a particular campaign, but the duration is very short, perhaps these aren't quality calls, and you may want to dive deeper into that and make sure that uh, you know that that this is these are really the conver- the conversions that you want to be generating and paying for. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to ask come back to Eric again. Um, something that always comes up with in the, the mobile local search space is apps. From the marketing perspective, from the marketer standpoint, what are the differences between mobile search and in-app search? Well, I think there are a couple things to look at. I mean. One is, um, with mobile search, obviously, you can be a lot less selective about what content you put out there. Uh, you have the ability to uh, create and post content more easily and more rapidly. Uh, whereas with mobile apps, you know, I really would, uh, you know, I'd really encourage people to do an extra layer of research before they start choosing their topics. Now, I think, uh, in addition to that, you know, certainly the fact that people are going to be able to find your content uh, just by doing a search in your phone is going to be really, it, it, it's, going, it's kind of a, you know, not only is that one point going to be very important, but in light of the things that Blair said, the points that he made about some of these other devices and some of these other ways that people are going to search in the future, I think that that mobile app content is going to become even more important. Okay. All right. Well, this concludes our webcast for today. I'd like to thank our speakers for giving great presentations and thank our sponsor, Dialogue Tech, for making today's webcast possible. And remember that the entire webcast will be archived and will be available for future viewing. We will send you the link to access the on-demand version via email, and we encourage you to share this information with your colleagues. Thank you for attending today's broadcast, and have a great afternoon.